Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kreit and I'm the host for today's talk. If you're participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation. And we will have time to address these questions after the presentation is complete. So today's speaker is Andrew Harvey, who's presenting his research with uh, Daisuke Shinagawa. Uh, Andrew is a research fellow at the Leiden University Center for Linguistics. The title of his current funded research is Gorga, Hatsa and Hihanzu, grammatical, uh, grammatical inquiries in the Tanzanian Rift Valley area. His research includes the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, their documentation and description, their formal morphosyntax and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities. Um, Daisuke is an associate professor at the Research Institute for Languages and Cultures of Asia and Africa at Tokyo University of Foreign Studies. His research interest is descriptive linguistics on Bantu languages, and since 2000 he has been working on Kilimanjaro Bantu languages like Ra, Shiha, and Rombo. Um, please join me in welcoming uh, Andrew as he gives his presentation, Tone in Ihanzu. Thank you. Uh... Anna. So hello, everybody. And uh, yes, today I'm going to be talking about uh, tone in a Bantu language I've been working on for a probably two or three years now uh, called Ihanzu. So this project uh, grew out of a period of time that I spent uh, in Tokyo uh, with uh, Daisuke Shinagawa, who uh, has obviously been working with uh, Kilimanjaro Bantu for some time. Uh, which is known for its uh, complex tonal phenomena. And at th this time, I mean, Ihanzu was the first uh, tonal language that I have uh, worked on, or the first Bantu tone language that I've worked on, I should say. Um, so our time together was a lot of Daisuke sort of mentoring me in uh, how tone worked. Uh, I had some data and I uh, was going through lexical items and, and short phrases, mainly elicited at this point. And uh, this is sort of a report on what uh, I came out with. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what you think about the, uh, about the patterns. Uh, and I've tried to incorporate as many recordings as possible. So I hope that that um, technology works. And uh, yes, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing what you have to say afterwards in your comments and questions. So um, basically, uh, Ihanzu is a Bantu language in uh, Guthrie's F30 group, which is not without its controversy. Uh, it's, it's hard to imagine that F30 is a, um, a valid or a coherent genetic entity, but at least geographically, we have a lot of F30 languages sort of spoken in this large red circle on the map in set in Tanzania. So F30 includes uh, Rangi and Mbugwe sort of on one side and uh, on the other it includes languages like uh, Rimi or uh, Nyaturu as it's also known, uh, Nyilamba, and uh, the language that we're focusing on today, um, Nisanzu or Ihanzu. Um, and these three languages uh, one can say are quite um, reliably genetically linked. It seems like there's, um, there's a lot of similarity there but their, their relation to Rangin and Bugwe is far from clear. Indeed, so on the larger map, what we can see here is uh, we can see sort of a, a, a hilly area or sort of an area of, of striated hills here near Mkalama. And uh, we can also see Haidom town to the east. So if we look at this, uh, Ihanzu is essentially spoken in this large area, sort of the cultural center or the heart of uh, this community. Oh, we have a Sorry about that. I'm uh, very close to a busy street here right now. That's fine. So up in these hills is sort of the uh, traditional, uh, most important sort of heartland of, uh, of Ihanzu. Actually, there's a, there's a community called Ikolo there, which is sort of heart or center. Um, and the community is sort of based uh, in these hills, but it spreads out to the, to the larger sort of lowlands as well. Uh, west of Mkalama, and essentially right to uh, the uh, Rift Valley Escarpment here uh, to the left. So you can see this sort of line of hills here to the west on the map. Um, and then Gumanga, when you start moving into places like Gumanga, you get a lot of mixing with uh, Nyiramba. 
As you go north here, you can see Lake Iasi to the north, this patch of blue uh, beyond the uh, borders of Singida. This is where Ihanzu uh, mixes with uh, especially Hadza, but also Iraq and uh, Datoga. We get a lot of Sukuma to the north uh, west. So looking at this in care of Google Maps, we can see if we begin in Mkalama here and we are moving counter, we are moving clockwise. Um, so we can see uh, the hills here, we can see Mkalama, and uh, much of the uh, geography is, uh, is very flat, well at least in here we have some rolling hills, we can see Mount Hanang to the, to the left of the screen, it's just passed out of our view, and now we can see the uh, Rift Valley escarpment that brings us up to the Nyilamba Plateau. Uh, Ihanzu communities go essentially right to these uh, mountains. Um, and then now looking north, we can see uh, the uh, Sibiti River as it flows northwards into Lake Iasi. And finally, finishing our uh, turn 180 degrees, we can see Lake Iasi, which is visible as sort of a bluish brown streak uh, up uh, towards the top of our screen. Uh, so I have a short recording of Isaac, Isaac Shawery and Musa Gimbi as they're flipping through photos of birds and describing them to each other. This, hopefully this will give us a sense for how the language sounds. Mm. So essentially, um, yes, so, so as we can hear, this is a bit of uh, the Ihanzu language. Um, it's a Bantu language. Perhaps one of its most defining feature is um, its reduction of um, certain fricatives to uh, a ha huh sound. So in uh, nearby languages, the word for young man is masomba, and uh, in Ihanzu, it's um, muhumba. And we can see this in uh, the name of the language as well, where outsiders will call the language Ihanzu, the Ihanzu people themselves will call it Ihanzu. Um, there are also some, some other um, interesting features of uh, the language. For example, uh, in forming a diminutive, uh, morphologically, they will use the word, um, uh, they'll use the word ngwa, they'll use a, a prefix. So a small house, a house is a nyumba. If you want to say small house, they will say ngwa nyumba. They don't make as extensive um, recourse to class seven uh, prefixes, so a small house is Juan Yumba, and uh, further research, especially in the morphosyntax of the language, will tell us more uh, about the peculiarities and unique uh, traits and features of Ihanzu. But of course, we need to start somewhere, and it was very surprising to me um, how largely um, tone featured in Ihanzu morphosyntax. Um, there are two levels of tone. There's high and there's low. Low being, if we want to posit a privative system, we can say low is zero. Um, and uh, it, ha it carries a, a considerable functional load across the lexicon and the grammar of the language. And this is what I want to explore today. Um, so the data itself, first of all, this um, recording will be available uh, on the Rift Valley Network website. Excuse me, we have another emergency vehicle moving by the house. Uh, sorry for that. We can start uh, 
again. So the data, um, the recording will be available uh, on the Rift Valley Network's YouTube site. It will be recorded and, uh, and it will be available there in the coming days so it can be watched and listened to again. Um, and uh, the data itself, so most of the recordings and most of the, well, all of the examples that I will be giving you today uh, can all be found eventually on uh, this um, open access uh, repository of Ihanzu material. So this is, a, this is an archive at, uh, that's uh, archived with uh, ELDP uh, in London, the Endangered Languages Documentation Program. Uh, and so all the recordings uh, you'll be able to uh, listen to either online or you can download and consult uh, later on. Uh, so in that, um, in that vein, and to make it easier for uh, you to um, recover this data and to listen to it for yourself, uh, all the examples are accompanied by a, uh, a unique identifying number to the right of the example. So here we can see an example and to the right of it is a unique identifying number. Um, this unique identifying number can be broken into two uh, constituents. There's a constituent to the left. Uh, this alpha numeric uh, constituent is uh, the identifier for the recording. So what you could do with this if you want to, um, if you want to locate the recording in which an example is uh, given, you can go to the uh, deposit uh, and the website is given in my references at the end. Um, and you will uh, search the deposit. So you'll enter the number into uh, the box in the corner, the search bar, and you should come up with the um, file. Further, then we have um, a, a number which occurs after the full stop. And this number corresponds to the utterance uh, in the ALON file. So, so the, uh, the files have been transcribed and translated. And um, if you're looking for uh, if you're looking for the exact example, you can uh, follow that number and it will bring you to the exact segment number. So you can listen to it again and again. Um, research um, that figures in this talk uh, was made uh, possible by the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, uh, which funded me during the uh, 2019 and 2020 year. And uh, now more recently, um, through the Endangered Languages Documentation Program, uh, which is funding me from 2020, well, from 2019 up until the end of 2021. Um, so as an introduction, um, tone plays a role uh, in the lexicon of Ihanzu, um, but it also plays a role in the grammar. So let's start with um, minimal pairs of lexically contrastive tone in uh, Ihanzu, so we have a uh, we have a verb in, in the infinitive, infinitive like kukonga, which is to prepare greens, and then we have kukonga, which is to deceive. And I, I won't pronounce all this. I'll try and uh, and I'll try and rely on these recordings. Kukonga. I'll play it again. Kukonga. And then. Kukonga. Kukonga. So here we have, uh, we have a minimal pair of lexically contrastive tones. So we see if we have, uh, we have high tone on the, uh, on the second example here at the end, and it, and it means to deceive um, versus uh, low tone on uh, the final syllable here, and it is to prepare greens by stripping the tough stems. Cool. Cool. And uh, so we have uh, another example here uh, so this is for a noun rather than a verb. So we have ntundu. Ntundu. And I'll play it again. Ntundu. Versus. Ntundu. Uh, ntundu. So we have ntundu versus ntundu. So it's gallbladder versus frog. Um, and now we can look at a minimal pair of grammatically contrastive tone. So here we have an example of the person of the subject making a, uh, uh, being uh, distinguished tonally. Um, so you'll see in these examples, we have, um, we, we actually have the uh, pronoun is explicitly uh, given here, but the pronoun doesn't need to be explicitly given. Um, it can be, uh, it can be left out as is very common in the Bantu languages in the area, in which case uh, what we have is uh, tone is left to help us distinguish whether we're talking about second person singular or third person singular. So I'll give you the example here. Uh, you are grinding. Oe okosia. 
Ue Okosia. So we have Ue Okosia, and then we have Mwenso Okosia. Play it again. Ue Okosia. Oh. Mwenso Okosia. So we have Okosia and Okosia being the uh, the uh, defining difference in uh, you are grinding and he or she is grinding. Mwen um, the tone bearing unit in Ihanzu is the syllable. Uh, and we can see this again in our example, konga. 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 So we see a uh, we see a movable tone here, which is represented by an offset, um, by an offset acute uh, mark in the uh, in the glossing here, in the uh, in the broken uh, form on the second line here underneath kukonga. And uh, instead of moving to the uh, nearest mora, which is actually the nasal here, uh, it moves to the uh, syllable. Uh, so the vowel, it will move to the final uh, vowel there. So this uh, tells us that in Nihanzu, the tone bearing unit is the syllable rather than the mora. So we can never get a form like kukonga that hasn't been recorded and I don't expect uh, to record it. Cool. Um, and uh, so let's move uh, quickly on to the tonal rules in Ihanzu. So these are the underlying rules after looking at um, the examples and the data that I've had. I've been trying to um, posit uh, the rules that underlie this uh, system. And uh, so hopefully the, by the rules that I've posited, we get a sort of an understanding of, of, how, uh, of how tone manifests itself on the surface in spoken uh, Ihanzu. So I'm positing, I'm positing underlying tones and tones that uh, stay in one place and tones that move. So for example, uh, we have, uh, again, if we use our example kukonga, which is to deceive, uh, this is represented by a movable tone on the uh, verb root here. So we can see that the verb root is kong, but it has a movable uh, it has a movable tone, which again is represented by an acute accent um, uh, offset from the nucleus of the uh, of of the um, syllable where it is manifest. Um, and what we see is uh, in uh, on the surface, uh, this tone shifts right. So we have kukonga, even though the the high tone is an element of the uh, of the uh, stem here of the verb root. Um, now some uh, tones in Ihanzu are movable. So for example, um, subject marking tones uh, appear to be movable and um, the tones on lexical verb uh, roots or stems are movable. Uh, but then uh, other uh, tones are underlyingly um, immobile, they don't move. So for example, in our second example here, kukuwanga, um, this uh, high tone that is on the repetitive morphine ang uh, doesn't move. So to hit repeatedly, um, that uh, morpheme is, uh, is ang, and the ang doesn't move. So we'll play this example again. Kukonga. Kukonga. And um, so we can see that, we can see that if a tone, if a movable tone uh, shifts, to a tone that is already high, this doesn't create an extra high tone or any sort of special uh, tone. Basically, it has uh, no effect. So if we, look at, uh, if we look at this form here, if we look at the form, the man who hit the boy uh, versus the man hit you, uh, I want us to focus on the verb here, azumukwile here in this example. What we have is we have the relative N with a movable high tone uh, shifts that high tone onto the uh, second past morpheme here highlighted on the second line of the example here, aza, um, and that has a mobile high tone. So essentially underlyingly we have both of these high tones manifesting on the initial morpheme and uh, this creates no difference. It's no, it's no phonemic difference and it's no phonetic difference here. So, so a high tone that shifts onto another high tone, the cumulative effect is zero. And so we can see here, we can see in the second example underneath, we can see uh, 
that this uh, doesn't have a tone moving onto it, so we can show that it is already high. Uh, and I'd like to uh, play the examples, and, I, and if we could pay attention to that aza or that ah uh, sound in the beginning of the verb there. Umugoha nazumukuiromuhumba. So we get umugoha nazumukuiromuhumba. I'll play it again. Umugoha nazumukuiromuhumba. And so now I'd like us to listen to the uh, the vowel, that first vowel on the verb in the second example. Umugoha azumukuile unyenye. I'll play it again. Umugoha. So I've taken two of these examples and I've um, put them onto a, uh, I, I, I've put them into press so we can see the pitch uh, track here and just to see that there's no real sort of special intonation for a high tone moving on to another high tone. Uh, so we can highlight these. Uh, this is the, uh, this uh, circle to the left uh, in, in the leftmost uh, example here. Uh, on the pitch track, so the blue line is the pitch track here. We can see we have um, we we have a, a prominent high tone, but um, it's nothing it's nothing more prominent than the uh, pitch track to the right here. There's nothing particular. Obviously, it's two different speakers here, but we can see in terms of relative uh, relative pitch here, we don't really see anything that's significantly different in the pitch track. I'd like to now move on to Mason's rule, which basically says that if we have a series of high tones that occur contiguously, underlyingly, then all of the contiguous uh, tones in that string will be deleted except for the first high tone in that, in that string. So for example here, we have, um, we have for example, um, ukumuka ga, which is uh, which is you are warding him off with uh, with traditional medicine, and uh, in this case, what we have here is if we look at the first uh, second uh, the subject marker, the second uh, singular subject marker, this has a movable tone that moves on to the progressive marker ku, but the object so the the the, the class one object marker is also high. But what happens is, is um, that marker, uh, that high tone is deleted as a result of Mason's rule. So we get ukumu kaga instead of ukumu kaga. Um, and we can, see, uh, we can see the high tone uh, manifest on the object marker, the class one object marker in the example. He is warding him off where uh, we don't see uh, Mason's rule because there's no string of high tones. So here we see he is warding him off as ukumukaga. Um, and I'll play this example uh, in a moment. So here we can see a potential string of high tones on the ku and the mu in the first example, and the mu's high tone is deleted as a result of Mason's rule. And here uh, in the second example here, and he is warding him off, we don't see that deletion because we have no um, string of high tones. So I will play the example here. So we have ue ukumukaga when so you are warding him off. We have the two pronouns. Um, so I'll play it again. Ue ukumukaga wins. Okay. And um I'll play the second one for comparison. Play it again. Okay. Um I'll play the second one for comparison. So we have ukumukaga versus ukumukaga. And uh, so we can see Mason's rule at play here. Um, and we can see it, uh, we can see, for example, that Mason's rule does not apply. Uh, so the domain of Mason's rule is the um, word, but uh, it, it doesn't apply across words. So uh, if we see here in this example, the man who hit the boy, we can see uh, two high tones are um, realized in a sequence here. Uh, but neither uh, is deleted. The one on the right uh, we see still exists. It's not deleted because Mason's rule doesn't apply across uh, a word boundary. So in this case, the man who hit the boy, that uh, first vowel of the verb there, that ah, uh, maintains its high 
tone and we can play that. So I'll play it again. The man who hit the boy. Uh, downdrift is another um, is another tonal rule in Ihanzu, and basically this is a rule that conspires to uh, lower the relative um, pitch or lower the relative uh, pitch or height of um, all uh, of all high uh, tones in a uh, in a uh, in a phrase. So what we have here is uh, we have three high tones here in this phrase, the man hit you, plural. And what we will see is even though these tones are uh, phonemically high, they're still marked and they're still heard as high uh, by Ihanzu speakers, their relative uh, height uh, decreases as the phrase goes on. So what we have is the ah of the umugoha is the highest of the high tones, and then all of the subsequent uh, high tones are realized as a little bit Lower, so I'm going to play that. So I'm going to play it again, and we can see we can see a steady declination there. It's a down drift. So I've charted this out using uh, prot again. So what we can see, I'm going to draw a red circle around each of these uh, high tones, and what we can see is a steady sort of down drift. Um, and it's, uh, it's interesting to note here that if this is a relative clause, I'll, I'll drag up this example again, we can see that the relative pitch actually isn't disturbed. So when I'm talking about a phrase, I want to be, I want to be clear that um, it seems in this case that if a relative clause intervenes, it resets the down drift phenomenon. So here what we can see is the man who hit the boy. This um, a here of the verb is not uh, reduced in any sort of relative way. So we can listen to this. So I'll play it again. So we can see that there's no relative downdrift here. It seems that the introduction of the relative clause has broken the downdrift. So clearly there's a um, there's a syntactic um, uh, there's a, there's syntactic um, effects that um, that correlate with uh, how downdrift works in Ihanzu. So I'll show you this again on Prat. So we see this first high tone and we see the second one. Um, now obviously we can see that there's a little bit of declination there, but it's not as uh, it's not as um, it's not as uh, what's the word? It's not as marked as what you would hear in a uh, in one single phrase without the relative. So that's interesting and I think it's worth looking at a little bit more. Um, we also have this high to falling rule in Ihanzu and basically what this says is if we have a high uh, tone at the end of a phrase it will be realized as falling. So for example here we have this word the clothing which is when that um, and uh, if it's within a phrase it's not realized as falling. So let's listen to this high tone. When that I'll play it again. Excuse us for that rooster in the background. Um, and then I will uh, play an example in which the uh, word wenda occurs at the end of a phrase, and you should hear a slight uh, falling. I'll play it again. So you can see it's a slight falling. And uh, I'll show you what we see here is uh, we see this high tone, so nguenda, uh, and apologies, you can see the, uh, the rooster is, uh, is manifest in the, in, the, in the tone track there on those, on those high blue lines on the left there. But the circled content is what we're interested in. So nguenda, we can see that high tone. And when nguenda is at the end of a phrase there, we see a falling realized. Um, Another rule, and it's sort of a final adjustment rule in Ihanzu, is high tone insertion. So what this does essentially is if there is no high tone on a verb, in a verbal word, as nurse would put it, um, what happens is uh, 
I suppose there's some sort of underlying rule that will uh, that will override the this this series of low tones, and it puts a high tone on the uh, it puts a high tone on the initial syllable of the macro stem uh, in the nurse's uh, terminology. So, for example, uh, we have an example of um, high tone insertion on this first uh, phrase here. We have the boy is jumping, um, and I'll give you this example here. I'll show you again. So we get Ugupota. Even though there's no there's no high tone to be seen there, uh, we see that um, there is a uh, there's a high tone that's inserted on the uh, initial syllable of the macro stem. And to show that there's usually uh, usually if there's um, if there's a high tone anywhere else in the verb word. Uh, this high tone insertion won't happen. So in the second example underneath here, I'll play it. I'll play it again. What we have is we have a high movable tone for the subject marking, the first person plural subject marking on this. We are jumping. And it moves to the uh, progressive marker, uh, which is realized as a high toned U. Um, and that high tone on puta is not realized. So we see that high tone insertion does not apply uh, if there is a high tone elsewhere in the verbal word. And so we can see this difference highlighted here. And that obviously has to be marked because this is a, uh, this is a phonemic uh, tone. So we can see the series of low tones here. There's nothing high tone on this verb. So uh, we get on the, uh, on, the initial, uh, on the initial syllable of the macro stem, we see a high tone included. Now to uh, show you that this is not the, the, the penultimate um, syllable of the macro stem or any other syllable of the macro stem. I have a, I have a uh, bisyllabic, um, I have, well, I have a trisyllabic um, uh, macro stem here. So what we see here is he is snoring. This is again with, uh, with the high tone insertion. So we'll get that again. So again, we see uh, a high tone has been inserted uh, on the initial stem, on the initial syllable of the macro stem, because there is no uh, high tone in this form underlyingly here, ukukoloma. Uh, whereas uh, when there is a high tone inserted, uh, when there is a high tone, uh, say for example on this uh, on this uh, class two subject marker, um, which uh, which moves to the progressive marker, we get akukoloma, and we don't get that rescue high tone on uh, the macro stem. So I'll play it. Versus. I'll play the second one again. So there we don't see high tone insertion. We only see it on uh, an underlying form which lacks a high tone. So we can see that. Uh, I'd like now to pass to the tonal patterns for Ihanzu nouns. I'd like to look at sort of these lexical tone patterns that exist in Ihanzu and try and make some sense of, uh, of why we get these, these forms lexically. So obviously with a disyllabic noun, we have four logical uh, surface realizations. We have a disyllabic noun that is low, low. We have a disyllabic noun that is low, high. We have a disyllabic noun that is high, low. And we have uh, a disyllabic noun that is high, high. And that underlying representation would, if we're, if we're positing a, primi a privative system, we would have a uh, no tone, no tone. Uh, we would have for low high, we would have no, no tone, high tone. For high low, we would have high tone, no tone. And for, uh, uh, for high high, we would have high tone, high tone. Uh, actually, we get the first three uh, of these uh, configurations. So we get a form like eyebrows. So that's low, low. We get a uh, we get, uh, low high, like the word for lime. And we get high, low, which is kolo. Uh, kolo. Kolo. Uh, we don't see high, high, uh, and this makes sense uh, because uh, this makes sense because uh, we can posit one underlying high tone per lexical stem, and this very well may be uh, germane to Mayusen's rule on a lexical level. Um, so moving on from here, 
uh, for monosyllabic nouns, uh, and this is not really surprising, uh, we would have low and high. These are the two logical, um, uh, these are the two logical um, alternatives here, um, representing uh, no tone versus high tone. Both of these are licit, so we see for an example, uh, ilu, which is ni. Ilu. Ilu. And then we have the word for stomach. Da. Da. So we can see that two of these examples are manifested in the lexical nouns of ihanzu. Da. Um, for polysyllabic nouns, um, we have eight uh, logical, um, we have eight logical um, arrangements here, uh, obviously representing the following underlying representations. Uh, we only see, though, four, uh, four of these eight being licit. So we have low, 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 like blood. Sakam. Play it again. Sakam. And we have low, low, high. So dalimu, guest house. Dalimu. Dalimu. Uh, we have low, high, low, which is, uh, for example, hammer. Tulango. 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 And then we have high, low, low for peace. Matiliga. 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 So the form tiriga is our high, low, low. So the rest are illicit um, for the reasons that I would posit uh, below. So first of all, we can only have, uh, essentially what we can see is, uh, I'm going to stipulate this rule here, that there's a maximum one underlying high tone per lexical stem. And that seems to do a good job of uh, precluding all the other forms. So I'm going to uh, include that as a uh, tonal uh, rule for uh, forming these lexical forms in uh, Ihanzu. Um, so then we have monosyllabic verbs, and this is rather interesting. So we, uh, we obviously have two logical um, examples here. We have low and we have high. Um, but also uh, in the data, what we see is we see a, uh, we see these monosyllabic verbs whose uh, stems are low, but their following, um, their following vowel, and this is usually the final vowel, is high. So uh, I'd like to show you the example of these two licit examples. So we have kuga. Uh, Unfortunately, I don't have the recordings uh, in this presentation. I ran out of time, um, if you'll allow. Uh, but we have, uh, we have kuga, which is to winnow, uh, like beans, for example. And then we have kutala to send. So in which case, uh, the high uh, tone is not actually on the verb stem, but it moves to the, uh, to the final vowel. And uh, high is illicit, I argue, uh, because for verbs, the high tone must shift. So if they're monosyllables, we can only have low or low with a high tone afterwards, indicating that the high tone has shifted, uh, but we cannot have high because that would indicate that the uh, high tone uh, remains uh, immovable, which seems to break the rules in Ihanzu. Moving on to disyllabic verbs, we obviously have uh, we have seven uh, logical um, configurations here. Underlyingly, this would be what we have. Uh, and remembering that high tone must move in uh, Ihanzu, um, we have these two are licit. So we have forms like kupilema, which is to wander. Kupilema, that's to wander. And then we have high, low, which is kutakuna. Kutakuna, which is, a, so that's a low high example. And underlyingly, it's a high tone that shifts to chu. Um, all the other forms are illicit. And let's get into why that is the case. We see a conspiracy of, of different uh, restrictions. So for example, these uh, forms here, the, the, the low, High with the following uh, high is illicit because we can only have a maximum of one underlying high tone per lexical stem. And the same uh, restriction sinks a surface high, low, then high on the final uh, vowel, or a high, high. Uh, we can only have one underlying high per lexical stem. Um, giving ourselves a little bit more space here. A high, low pattern is illicit because tone must shift. And it also further sinks these uh, two final configurations underneath. They are no goes. Uh, and the top example of having a low, low, high doesn't work because it seems as if the underlying high must be on the first syllable 
only. And that, of course, can apply to all the other examples here. So these three restrictions seem to explain why we have um, two of these realizations on the surface, but not the uh, entire seven that are logically possible. Um, in terms of unanswered questions, um, obviously we, we've posited these uh, based on the data that we have. I, I think it's important now to look at the tone of individual, especially functional morphemes. So I mentioned at the beginning that some of these functional morphemes like subject marking morphemes, they tend to have high tone that is movable, uh, but then uh, there, there are a lot of other uh, morphemes that have high tone that is fixed. Uh, so this is, uh, this is interesting, uh, these forms which are high uh, versus, uh, versus high uh, movable. Uh, it'd be interesting to see if there was any sort of consistency or, consi yeah, sort of, there's any sort of consistency across uh, what moves and what does not. And also just to figure out whether these morphemes are actually low toned or high toned. So that's an interesting question. And then we have pragmatic tone contours and their interaction with phonetic tone. So I think that there are further overlays in the syntax um, that will uh, dictate um, what the final tone uh, is realized as on surface level. And I think that these things can sometimes supersede or further layer over what we've worked out today in our discussion. So for an example, if I give you umugoha alum kuile, so we can see here that the man hit him. Uh, and uh, we can see that this, uh, that this uh, final verb here on the ile here, it goes down the pass marker. So if we listen to this. So I'll listen to it again. Interestingly though, if we have an object such as this boy, I mean, it's the same verb and it's the same um, subject, but what we simply have is we have, uh, we have a, an expressed uh, object afterwards. I'd like you to listen to what happens to the end of this uh, verb here, alumukuile. Omugoha alumukuile omuhumba for you. So we'll listen to it again. Omugoha alumukuile omuhumba for you. So for as much as I've stipulated what tone looks like and, and how most of the tone uh, rules work, it seems as if uh, when we have an object at the end of the verb, we have a, uh, we can get a high tone at the end of the verb as well. That needs to be looked into uh, more rigorously and it needs to be discussed and it needs to be um, examined whether that's consistent throughout the data, whether that's something that only occurs uh, in, in verbs in the past. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, unanswered questions uh, that remain, but I think that this is a good start. And uh, yeah, I think it will, it's a good way to get one's feet wet in the grammar of a language where tone has a high functional load, like Ihanzu. Thank you, and uh, these are my references. Thank you, Andrew, for this really interesting presentation. Uh, I think that means it's now time for the question and answer section. If anyone would like to ask a question or offer a comment, you can do so using the Zoom chat module. And I will start with my own, so everyone else has some time to write. Um, so I don't know much about tonal systems in Bantu languages. So I was wondering, um, how does the tonal system of Ihanzu compare to um, the tonal systems or phonetic systems of nearby Bantu languages? Yes. So this is this is a good question. I know uh, I know, for example, well, working working with Daisuke and Daisuke would would back me up on this is that the uh, tonal systems of uh, the languages like Chaga, for example, are it's more complicated. Um, I can't precisely remember whether that's because there are more tonal levels in uh, some of the Chaga varieties, but um, Daisuke would have more uh, information on that. So that's obviously one uh, possible difference. I believe that uh, Sukuma actually, which is a closer sort of example, um, it's an F20 uh, uh, group language and it borders on Ihanzu uh, and these other uh, F30 group languages sort of in the neighborhood. Um, and I believe that Sukuma has a, uh, it also has a super high uh, as well as high and uh, low or nothing. And I think that there may actually be more. I was recently reading Herman Batibo's uh, work in the 80s on Sukuma, and it appears as if it's a much more complicated system. Now, with that said, I haven't given uh, Ihanzu a 100% detailed look yet. So I think it requires, it requires a good look 
And, um, you know, maybe some more of these complexities will come out in different ways. That wouldn't be entirely surprising given the similarities between languages like Sukuma and languages like uh, Nyaturu and uh, Nilamba and Ihanzu. Um, that's really all I can say. I know that further south, for example, you know, we sort of get this whole smorgasbord in, in terms of Bantu tone. Uh, we look at some of these G languages, I believe, so languages in Swahili, but also languages spoken in uh, the Usambara Mountains. Um, I believe that uh, some of these languages don't have tone at all. So, so Swahili can be convincingly argued that there's no tone. Um, and uh, in some of these, uh, in some of these languages, uh, Adoram Moro Goro, which isn't super far away from our from our uh, neighborhood, if we take a continental look at the scale, um, we we have languages that don't have uh, that don't seemingly have any uh, tone. So I find that very interesting. So that's sort of a tops of trees comparison of of, of the different Bantu tone uh, systems in in the neighborhood. Thank you. Yes, really interesting. Um, I'll now go to the first comment. Um, it's from Richard and he says, thanks for the presentation, Andrew. Uh, he just has a quick comment uh, as there is a similar high tone phenomenon in um, Asimyek Datoga that occurs right after the verb when an NP follows it. Oh, that's quite interesting that there would be, uh, now, I, I mean, I would need to look at this. So then so then it goes to the question. So Asimyek Datoga is obviously a, a Southern Nilotic uh, language and and uh, and uh, Ihanzu is a Bantu language. So you know the question then becomes: Okay, is is this sort of high tone with following NP? Is this uh, is this a feature due to contact? Is this something that occurs commonly in Bantu languages? Again, Ihanzu is the first Bantu language with tone that I've looked at. I don't know if this is something that's common in Bantu or if this is actually a um, a, uh, a a, a, a reflex of tonal phenomena that occur in uh, Southern Nilotic. I think that's a very interesting thing that we could look at. Um, and I think that we could probably, we could probably piece that apart. I know that it's been, the, the argument has been made that in uh, uh, Nyaturu, there was considerable uh, influence from, uh, from the Toga varieties. So um, it wouldn't be incredibly surprising if there was um, if there was an influence in Ihanzu or in the entire sort of F30 uh, group. Thank you. Uh, I'll move on to a question by Rono Kiesling. He asks uh, if there's any further generalization on which tones are mobile and which are not. Lexical verb tones obviously always shift. Uh, are all grammatical tones immobile and what about tone in nouns? So yeah, so from what I've seen, the tone in nouns is stable, whereas tone in verb root, so, so in, the lexical, in the lexical sort of non, noun stems, the tone is always stable, so it doesn't move. Whereas if we talk about the lexical verbs, if there's tone there, it moves. So it's always movable in, the, in, in these lexical verb tones. Um, so the grammatical tones are not always immobile. Like I said, the subject marking uh, tones are mobile, whereas the uh, object marking tones, as far as I know, are, um, are not mobile, but I need to look at that a little bit closer. Um, there's interactions of things there that obscure whether, whether that pattern is valid or not. Um, so, so yes, I would like to be able to make further generalizations, but at this point I, uh, I can't, but I'm excited and I, and I wouldn't be surprised if there were further generalizations to make. I think that what that will be contingent on is getting more, um, is getting more uh, clear examples of what morphemes carry what tone and whether that tone is moving. So that's sort of a further question that we can, uh, that we can look at. But I, yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. Thank you. Okay, I have a last question from Michael Karani. Um, he wonders if there uh, are more grammatical functions of tone in Ihanzu, so for example, tense, aspect, or mood. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is also um, something that, that has crossed my mind on many occasions because um, I, look at, I look at Herman Batibo's uh, work and he sort of talks about these tonal frames or these, these, these sort of, these, uh, what does he call them? These, these morpho, morphotonemes or something like that, but it's kind of like, if you're putting a verb into a particular tense or aspect or mood, um, whatever, the, whatever sort of that basic 
morpheme by morpheme tone works out to be, there's sort of a larger um, tonal, um, there's sort of a larger tonal frame that that goes into. So it will influence the, uh, the tone depending if something is in the past or whether something is continuous. So yeah, we need to, these are things that we need to look at. And um, yeah, I, I, I don't want to pretend that I have tense aspect or mood uh, figured out any Hanzu. I would argue that I, I don't have, uh, I don't have nearly that um, uh, figured out yet, but um, I think these are all exciting um, prospects that uh, can further be picked and poked at over the next little while as we get more data, and especially as we get natural language data. All right, thank you. Uh, I don't see any more questions in the chat module, so I think I have a final question uh, for myself. Uh, so do you see any variation within Ihanzu speakers? So for example, especially within generations, for example, um, do the younger generations still learn the entire tonal systems or do you expect there to be a reduction? This is an interesting, this is an interesting thing. Um, so uh, what we see is um, we see uh, a slow adoption of, and I mean, this is an entirely different talk, but I think it, 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 it kind of pokes at, at what you're asking here. Um, I haven't worked with enough people to really get a good sense for how sort of these generational or geographic differences or gender differences would influence on the tone. But what I can tell you is that um, it seems that Swahili loans are subtly playing with some of these underlying tone, uh, tonal rules in Ihanzu. So I've already said that verbal tone, if it's in the if it's in the the verb lexeme, must shift. Um, and this seems to apply to all verbs in Ihanzu except for one very meddlesome one, which is lim, which is the Swahili word for farm. In Ihanzu, the, uh, the, uh, the Ihanzu verb for farm is kugundula, um, which goes back to, to um, mugunda, which is, which is a field. But the, but, the verb in, but the verb in Ihanzu is kugundula. But very many people will uh, simply take the, uh, the stem uh, farm in uh, Swahili, lim, and they'll say kulima. But that's interesting because what we have is we have a high tone on the, uh, on the vowel of lim. So it'll be kulima. And interestingly, that high tone, well, it can't have moved from anywhere if we're still trying to preserve the system. Uh, it can't have moved from, uh, from any sort of lexical element before the L. Um, so what we have here is we have a fixed uh, tone in uh, Ihanzu that seems to be, um, that seems to be uh, predicated on the stress of uh, Swahili. So we have kulima in Swahili, which is to farm. Uh, and it seems like uh, what's happening is that was a stressed uh, vowel, and that seems to be reinterpreted in uh, Ihanzu as a high tone. But because it's a borrowing, uh, that high tone seems to be fixed. So if you look at examples of uh, this verb being used, lima, uh, the Swahili verb being used in uh, Ihanzu, it, it's, a, it's a huge exception. It does all sorts of silly things uh, that you wouldn't expect a, uh, an Ihanzu verb to do. Uh, so this is an, an interesting example of how perhaps a younger generation speech that uses more Swahili loans uh, will uh, ultimately contribute to the way that uh, Ihanzu uh, works in the coming decades and generations. And it's very interesting to look at this layering and this reinterpretation of stress as tone. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's really fascinating. Uh, I think in roughly the same area, Michael has another question. He asked if there are dialects in Ihanzu, and if so, which ones uh, are you working on? And if there's any tonal difference among the dialects? So I want to be careful here because the very first people that I spoke with um, uh, about Ihanzu, and they were Ihanzu speakers themselves, they told me that there were very distinct dialects in Ihanzu. Uh, but that's proven more and more surprising to me as I've moved around areas that people have told me are integrally part of the Hanzu area. There's, there seems to be, you know, relatively normal levels of mobility around the Hanzu uh, speaking area. People will marry people from different areas. They'll go and visit each other. 
Um, you know, people move between these communities for work, um, communal farming and house building and um, celebrations are, are very, very common and people will move from community to community. It seems like it's, it's, it's more homogeneous than what I was originally told. Now, with that said, I, you know, as somebody's knowledge of a language increases and as sort of the coverage increases and as we look at this sort of, um, as we look at this sort of um, natural speech, especially, we may start to see differences. It wouldn't be very surprising because, I mean, Ihanzu, there's no natural boundaries between uh, ethnic groups. There's, there's no hill that the Ihanzu have sort of retreated upon and become very different. They're down in a lower area. It's not hard for them to have contact with other people, such as the Hadza, such as the Nilamba, the Sukuma, the Iraq. So, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there are sort of these contact influences on the edges. Um, in terms of any sort of emic definitions of uh, dialects, I, I haven't seen anything convincing yet. Maybe I will. Um, and in terms of these tonal differences between the dialects, um, I haven't seen anything yet, but I suppose if there are if there are dialects in Ihanzu, this would be one of the very first places where you could look. All right, thank you. Uh, I think that's all the questions that we have for today. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page, and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Looking ahead, the next presentation in the webinar series will be given on Wednesday, March 25th by Andrew Harvey and Richard Grissom and is titled Retrospective of the Rift Valley Network webinar series, year one. Uh, I would like to thank Andrew again for his really interesting presentation and everyone else for participating today. And I hope to see you again at our next uh, 